Hello and welcome to Beamer Folk. I thought it was about time I did something about my microphone. I run um, Linux Mint and the microphone that I've used, I've noticed, creates, had an awful lot of noise in addition to the signal. This is, of course, something to do with plugging it into a computer. A computer is a very noisy, switchy environment, and that tends to get through the naught volts of screen onto the microphone. So I thought it was about time I did something about it. The microphone is an Electrep microphone, and within Linux I've been using something called, a bit of software called um, Echo Cancellation. Well, whilst this does a reasonably good job, it tends to make one's voice very digitalized, like a rather cheap mobile phone, or if you like, a Dalek, although other aliens in a tin can waving a sink plunger around are available. So I thought I'd make a project of this and build my own mic preamp. The budget I I have for this is zero. I can use the parts I have available to me in my workshop. I could adopt uh, an integrated circuit implementation, but these tend to draw quite a bit of current, and I intend to use a PP3 9-volt battery, alkaline battery, and so I'm looking for a very low current being drawn from it, and I expect the circuit to operate down to a fairly low voltage so that the battery can discharge quite a bit and it can still perform. The conclusion I came to is that I'd use discrete transistors, and that's what I opted for. My design approach will be not of copying anybody else. There are many microphone preamplifiers out there, but I'm going to design my own. And it will be with a pragmatic, practical approach. If you wish to see, and I can do the mathematical analysis of this circuit, but it'll take me quite a bit of time to complete that. But if you want a, a mathematical analysis, uh, I will put a link in the description below. Next, I'll be presenting an animated circuit simulation, which will outline my basic design. The online applet is produced by Paul Falstead. This is an excellent simulator. It's simple, which kind of suits me, and a link to which will be presented in the description below. Firstly, we place a transistor. This transistor is a BC546B for Barry. I would have preferred the 9 variation because it has a lower noise configuration, but this is what I had in the workshop and this is what I use. It's in a, um, a common emitter position. Um, the emitter resistor is there for thermal stability. I've now started to include a constant current source if you stick a simple resistor in the collector load of the first transistor that was placed, you tend to get non-linearity. So I've linearized this by including a constant current source, and that is by the two PNP transistors um, that I'm now placing. The first transistor I placed, of course, is an NPN. Those two PNP transistors are BC559. I've now uh, I'm now including a decoupling capacitor on the emitter so we get maximum AC gain with thermal stability with that emitter resistor. The other three resistors on the base are there to set the working point of the first transistor. I'm now including a battery set to 9 volts, which is the PP3 battery type. OK, I'm now putting in a, a coupling capacitor in the base. This, of course, is the input and is derived from the uh, electric microphone. I'm now putting in a couple of resistors and switches. This is for me to determine the input impedance of the circuit. 
I'm trying to make it 2.2k, which is by all accounts the nominal output impedance that an electric microphone likes to see. Okay, I've now uh, included the PNP transistor for a buffered output. You notice that it's emitter, it's in a common collector configuration, and I put the emitter resistor up to supply. Of course, supply volts is impedance wise the same as naught volts, zero impedance. And that is um, the zero impedance is basically going through the battery itself. The battery is behaving as an electrolytic capacitor. Now I'm starting to build the negative feedback. The negative feedback is quite complicated here. And of course the negative feedback also sets the working point of my first place transistor, the NPN transistor. I'm now including an output capacitor to the circuit from the buffer. And that's that uh, capacitor and resistor. OK, I'm now putting a resistor down to 0 volts. The simulator really likes on its capacitors to have some form of resistance, not just left floating. And also the simulator likes the earth or ground connection that I placed on the emitter of the first transistor, the NPN. I've now included a, um, an AC voltage source. OK, well, I'm setting up two 2.2K resistors in the, in the input configuration to the NPN transistor. Setting the 15K resistor, which is part of the working point of that transistor. Um, putting 10K into the emitter of the output buffer. Putting 2K7, of course, that builds... 0.65 of a volt to generate the constant current load of the NPN transistor. The Incidentally, the current flowing through the collector of the NPN transistor is quite low. It's 200 microamps. This is optimized for low noise operation of that transistor. So the constant current source needed to provide 200 microamps, 0.2 of a milliamp. The negative feedback has 15K from the output down through to 12K, which goes through to the base of the NPN uh, transistor, the first transistor I put down. You've also got at the junction of the 15K and the 12K, You've also got a, I think it's a 390 ohm resistor going to the 47 microfarad capacitor, which goes down to ground. That controls the gain of the overall circuit. What I'm doing now is changing the HFE characteristics of all transistors to 250 from 100. This has been checked on my transistor tester and the, or with all the transistors I put in here. Now this is the circuit simulator working dynamically. The yellow dots is current flow going from positive to negative. The greater the flow, the more current is going through that arm. The less of the flow the less current is flowing through and those yellow dots that are standing still where there's hardly any current flowing through at all. Say for example a capacitor. A capacitor uh, let's say here as you can see actually has no yellow dots moving whatsoever. Um, just to quickly go through this, um, the transistor here which is the NPN or the 546B is configured into a common emitter. The other three transistors, this is all a DC coupled amplifier, the other three transistors are PNPs and they are BC559. They are the nine variants, so they are uh, particularly low noise.
you have here a supply voltage which effectively is the battery supply and I've set this to 7.68 which is the voltage of my little PP3 it's partially discharged it's not at full 9 volts I won't go through all the circuit because I more or less covered it before I'll concentrate on feedback uh, input impedance and loading uh, I don't think I mentioned this resistor here. That's a base stopper and will prevent most high frequencies from getting through into the amplifier. It relies on the capacitance between the base and the emitter to function as a filter. The input impedance of this amplifier is actually quite low. And the way I check for input impedance is one point. 003 volts peak to peak and that is with this switch not engaged now if I engage this switch it goes to precisely twice the same value so the input impedance at this point here at these two points here is exactly the same as that resistor there which represents 127 ohms so the input impedance of this amplifier is 127 ohms. Well, the preferred optimum load for an electric microphone is 2.2 K ohms. So to get around this, I'm going to have to put a nominal 2.2 K at this resistor here. So I change that resistor effectively to a 2 K2 and that will optimize the load on the electric microphone. Regarding the feedback, the feedback is a bit complicated. There is a working point to these transistors which sets the output voltage here to more or less half VCC or half the battery voltage. Not quite, it's been adjusted very slightly to allow for the uh, slow discharge of the battery supply. So the battery can supply can move down to about six and a half volts maybe six volts dc and still provide nice looking signal here so the the transistors set at a working point and the working point is the dc considerations of these negative feedback resistors that's this resistor here that resistor there and this resistor here there is a junction at these two resistors here, the 15K and the 12K, which comes along this direction and down into here. This resistor, the 390 ohm resistor, sets the gain of the overall circuit. And to get the optimum gain for my particular electric microphone, I need this set to a gain of 200. The AC incidentally input is set at 1 kilohertz here. If you want this to within the bounds of gain here, um, if you want to set greater gain you can drop the resistor value of this down. Being mindful that the lower you get you have to actually increase the capacitance value here for a low frequency response. So the negative feedback comes from the output emitter here of this final transistor through effectively through to the base of the input transistor. And as they're all DC coupled, there isn't a problem with doing that. Now the current drawn from the battery. If I open at the moment, it's going all over the place because there is a sinusoidal waveform coming through. Let me switch off this um, input here. So you can see the whole of this circuit only draws 0.8 of a milliamp, very low. The frequency response of this circuit is very good. It goes from about 20 hertz up to around, it starts to roll off at about 44 kilohertz. So uh, whilst it draws little current, it actually has quite a good high frequency response. And in fact, the electric, the electret microphone will fall off in frequency at about 15 kilohertz. 
Now I'll just disengage this switch here and we've established that the input impedance of this is 127 ohms but for my Electret microphone um, that produces about 5 millivolts peak. So I'm going to put in the resistor here which is the optimum loading uh, nominal value of 2K2 okay and uh, that establishes the correct loading and I'll adjust this up because you can see that the output is actually dropped right down I'll adjust this to 5 millivolts which is there okay and as you can see we're up to 2.052 volts peak to peak We'll now go into checking the loading of this little Class A amp. Now at the moment I've got 22K and I brought this out to the slider here. If I increase the resistive loading it should stay more or less, which it is. I mean I'm up to, what am I up to? Let's go to 50K, which is here. And as you can see, it, it, it stays pretty stable. Now, if I come down, back down to, say, 10K, you've hardly got a drop there. So it can certainly take a 10K um, uh, load impedance. I'll push it further. I, I don't think it'll go beyond 5K. But here we are. OK, I've... Uh, uh, no, a little bit more. Try there. It's tr dropped down, what, uh, 0.06 of a volt peak to peak, which is not bad. But I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't uh, load it any more, this circuit. It really isn't designed or built for um, low impedance loads. OK, I'll bring this back up to 22K. I think the input impedance of my computer is about 50k but nevertheless I set it to say 22k. Let's have a look at the frequency response on this dynamically. If incidentally your electric, your particular electric microphone needs more gain you can get it by dropping that resistor there. If it needs less gain you can increase that resistor there. But if you drop the resistance here from 390 to a lower value Bear in mind that the overall circuit only has a finite amount of gain and you start to drop on bandwidth as well. But if you go in a, if you go to a lower resistance here, you might have to increase the uh, value of, res of capacitance here. At the moment it's 47 microfarad, but um, if you wanted a, um, a lower, a higher gain, but a lower resistor here, you might have to make this 100 microfarad. And if you wanted less gain, so this resistor would be higher, you could drop this down to 22 microfarad. Anyway, back to frequency response. What have we got? Yeah, 2.052 volts peak to peak. Now I'll just open this up. And here we are, we've got it set at uh, 5 millivolts. I've got 1K here. Let's make that 10K and see what happens. Let's go to apply. There you are. In fact, the voltage peak to peak has gone up very, very slightly. Move it to 20 kilohertz and apply. No change. So let me go down to 100 hertz and see how it looks then. The 100 hertz, hardly any change there. Make it, um, say, 50 hertz. Drop slightly by 0 0.00, no, 0 0.06 of a volt peak to peak. Right, bring it back up to 1k hertz, 5 millivolts, and here we are. It takes a moment or two for this uh, 
excellent little simulator to stabilize. Uh, putting a resistor here is not the best thing in the world. It's not a problem because the value is very low. And incidentally, in audio cir circuits, it's very wise to keep all resistive values of, as low as possible. Um, the noise that resistors can generate is proportional to its value. So the lesser is the better. There are one or two exceptions. Ideally, it'd be nice if there were a transformer in here converting the 2.2k ohm here through to um, um, 127 ohms. That's a luxury that I don't have. Here we are, we've arrived at my final circuit. There's only a couple of additional points that I would like to um, make on this. Firstly, is the resistor R1, and it's a 10k resistor. It's the phantom supply resistor to the electret microphone. The next point is R12, which is a 4.7k test point. This gives me the facility to measure the battery voltage when the supply switch is operated, uh, instead of having to go into the enclosure and measure it directly. It's there for convenience. The next point is the diode. Diode D1, which is a crosser supplier, protects the circuit from reverse polarity on the battery. So if you were to put the battery the wrong way around on the terminals, even for a moment, the circuit wouldn't go into destruction. It's a brutal configuration in the sense that it puts a short across the 9 volt battery and the limiting current therefore would be the internal resistance of the battery but that would cause a very rapid discharge but the chances of me putting the battery around the wrong way is pretty remote so I thought it was acceptable. Put the diode in series with the supply it drops a very small amount of voltage across it, even if you're using a Skotchki diode, you've got 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a volt drop. And when you've got a, a battery, 9 volt battery PP3 configuration, every little bit of juice count. You could consider a MOSFET a protection device, but that was overcomplicated for this simple little amplifier. The next point is C5, and that's 100 microfarad. It's simply there to remove any noise that there might be on the supply line. And finally, you've got the switch. Well, the switch goes from the positive terminal of the battery through to the supply line and now onto the board itself. So we've come to the real world implementation of my design. I put it on a piece of strip board, 16 holes by 16 holes. These are 0.1 of an inch pitch. I would add a little bit in either dimension. So make the board 1.8 inches by 1.8 inches. Of course, you can make it as large as you like, but it's got to fit in the enclosure. There's a little legend here, isn't there? The, the black dots are solder blobs. The red dots are a cut track, and I used a, a drill just to drill out the track, and that's the um, red dots. The green dots represent the two drill holes, and I used, I think, 2.5 millimeter drill to drill those holes so that it can be fitted on the um, case. We come to the wire connections. I didn't put any sockets on the enclosure. The problem is with sockets, they can become intermittent, they can become noisy. I actually preferred a direct connection, and I did that for both the input and the output. The output goes directly through the enclosure via a knot to act as strain relief with um, a meter and a half cable terminated with a 3.5 millimeter stereo jack plug and that plugs straight into my PC. The input, um, actually I had a 3.5 millimeter socketed lead which I cut in half again threaded through the hole of the enclosure, knotted, and uh, in fact, I both knotted the input and the output um, cables together. The top red and black wire, of course, goes to the battery via an on-off switch, and the blue wire goes to 9 volt DC test point so that you can test the battery voltage without actually opening up the enclosure. 
I would probably advise that D1 is stood off the printed circuit board surface and away from other components just in case the um, you um, just in case you inadvertently got the battery around the wrong way and it discharged the battery well it would discharge into D1 and D1 is likely to get a little warm. I don't know whether by now you've guessed the enclosure that I've used but you're about to get that confirmed or otherwise in the next slide. Did you guess this right? That it was a 340 gram originally tin of sweet corn. I said to you I had a budget of zero before didn't I? The structure of this tin is actually quite robust and ideal for screening my microphone preamp and it worked out quite well. You have to be mindful when you work this that tin can have um, a sharp edge. On the entrance there is a bit of a sharp edge on the inside of the tin incidentally but otherwise once thoroughly cleaned and being careful how you work it it actually provides a very good enclosure. As far as working it uh, I used a hand drill and a reamer. The reamer goes from about two millimeters through to 13 millimeters so it provided me with the means of reaming out whatever size holes I wanted. The size meant that I could quite easily install the components, the circuit board and do the wiring without too much of a problem. The black wire that goes from the little printed circuit board to the case I soldered to a washer that came with my on off supply switch. So I was able to get a good, and you need to test this and get a good connection there. Also my nine volt test point, I used one of those Arduino type interconnection wires that you can obtain in a quantity of them, you can get like a hundred of them. They are terminated in a pin. Well, I cut one of those in half and uh, used wire end to solder onto the um, printed circuit board. The other end, which is the pin, I made an exact drill hole in the top of the enclosure and I effectively glue that in so there is a pin sticking out the top of the tin can which I can use as a test terminal. Before I'm in fear of making this video too long, there are a couple of points that I'd like to add to this. One is how do I retain the battery with inside the tin can? Well I use two layers of bubble wrap I effectively stuff bubble wrap on the top of the printed circuit board and wiring, put the battery between that and the final piece of um, bubble wrap and that sort of seals the bottom and that's all I use. I would also like to uh, add that I have confirmed that the real world performance of this amplifier is slightly better than actually the simulated performance which I'm pleased about. Thirdly, I use an effects unit called Pulse within Linux. It's a very comprehensive device and uh, I need to use it because I operate here in my workshop in a fairly acoustically noisy background. It, there's a method of, um, of gating that acoustic noise out and that's what I employ. Also, the low frequency responses amplifier is so good that every bump tap on a table or a heavy foot on a floor comes through. So I include within Pulse a graphic equaliser and filter which cuts off the below 50 hertz uh, frequencies. As far as actually what the amplifier sounds like, well, you've been listening to it. The whole of this video was actually recorded using this microphone preamp. So what do you think? I think it actually sounds good. Certainly a lot better than the digital voice I heard of myself before. And finally, I'd like to give a shout out to DIYLC, which is the CAD program I use for the strip board and circuit diagram. 
I've included a link to them in the description below. Anyway, if you build this, I hope it performs as well for you as it does for me. This is Beamer signing out for now.